Alright guys, how's it going? A couple of videos ago I noted how that just before I transitioned the channel from a Let's Play to a tech channel, I had also made a few PC build videos. You can see them down here, PC builds with component links. So just over three years ago, and those were the only videos of this type that I ever released. And of course when I brought attention to them recently, I was asked to consider doing the same again. People are constantly buying PCs even though right now may be one of the worst times. Before I get to that, I'm just going to say that I likely won't do this kind of build video again. The YouTube channel is now pretty heavily tied to more technical and analytical videos, interspersed with some leaks, and I hadn't particularly intended that the channel go in that direction, but there's little denying that's where it went, and today I think it's what most of you really want. But getting back to this worst time to be buying a new PC or PC components, what do I mean by that? Well, even though I don't intend to make these kind of videos again, I was curious as to what kind of value could be wrung out of PC building today. But before I get to that, let's have another quick look at these old videos and what you got for your money three years ago. So if we just ignore this building for benchmarking video and concentrate on the other four, We've got this $450 branded 1080p gaming PC, a $750 solid performing i5 gaming PC, an overclockable i7 gaming PC for under $1000, and then at the end was the Smart Buyers 2000 high-end PC. And I'll just throw all the details into a table. Now I just used Amazon.com and Amazon UK for parts, mostly due to affiliate links and Fact is, looking much further than one seller is a bit of a pain. So if there's any parts there that you think look a little bit odd, that's probably why. But starting off with the 450 entry level PC, and my mission was to stay under $450 or £400 using only branded components. So none of the really low quality crap power supplies or anything like that. And also the build had to include an SSD and CPU cooling. So definitely no easy mission. Looking over the parts list, we have a decent chassis, the Carbide Spec O2, an Antec VP450 power supply, and then next up, the reason why this was such a cheap PC. Remember back to the pre-Ryzen days when your low-end choice was either the bulldozer-derived Athlon or a dual-core Pentium? That was a choice, and even though the Pentium was faster in most cases, games had actually begun to appear that simply would not run at all on a dual-core. For example, Far Cry 4 required four threads, or it simply would not run. And also note the Pentium's issues with 1% loads in some games, which is everything you would expect to see with a dual-core chip, even when the averages are higher. The graphics card in that build was actually pretty decent. An R7 370, which would fall a little behind a GTX 1050 today, but it was well ahead of far more popular cards like the 750 Ti and today's GT 1030. Also noteworthy is 8GB of decent DDR3 and both a 120GB SSD for the boot drive and a 1TB hard drive, with finally that cheap CPU cooler there to allow for overclocking the CPU. And honestly, for $450 back then, that wasn't bad. It was only let down by the unenviable Athlon, which was the better choice of two extremely bad CPUs. It would be interesting to see just how those match up in today's games. I'd be surprised if the Athlon wasn't a little ahead now, or at least much closer. Next up was a $750 build. So I'm sticking with the Carbide chassis, though the Zero one version. The power supply is now a Seasonic S12 II. For the CPU, I picked the i5-4590, that's a non-K, 8GB of RAM again. And the graphics card is the R9-380 Nitro, 4GB which was faster if less efficient than the GTX 960, but it also came with double the VRAM. The SSD has now doubled up to a 250GB Samsung EVO, and the hard drive stays at the same 1TB, with the build again rounded off with a cheaper CPU cooler. What do I think about this build? It's okay I guess, there was no realistic alternative to the i5-4590 while remaining in this price point. And the R9 380 is squarely in the solid performance category rather than anything spectacular. That's why this PC was labelled the solid performer. There is literally nothing special about it whatsoever. And next up was my personal favourite, the overclockable i7 gaming PC coming in at under $1000. 
It came with a great looking NZXT Phantom 240. I stuck with the Seasonic S12 too, but now we're really talking with the i7-4790K, which would have been almost on par with the just released 6700K, but it was a lot cheaper and there was no need to splash out on what was, at the time, extremely expensive DDR4. 8GB of RAM again, and this time the R9390 graphics card, which won out over the GTX 970. Same SSD and hard drive as before, and finally again, aftermarket cooling that wasn't too expensive and allowed the CPU to be overclocked. This one was definitely my favourite out of all of the builds. And finally, the Smart Buyers High End 2000 build had another nice chassis in the H440. This one had a kilowatt XFX Pro power supply, and this time the CPU was upgraded to a 5820K, so that's 12 threads instead of 8. So I was clearly thinking about future proofing a little there. We're also up to 16GB of DDR4, so again, some future proofing. And for the GPU, I chose the obvious 980Ti, which was the only smart choice at that time. Rounding it off, we have a 500GB SSD now, 2TB hard drive, and the awesome Noctua NHD15 cooler. It's alright this one. I clearly had future proofing in mind, and if you bought this PC 3 years ago, you're still gaming at a pretty high level, and it'll be good for another year or two yet. That's the benefit of dropping two grand on a PC, right? Six years or so of great performance. Actually, I would disagree with that, and the reason for that is, if you buy a PC to last, say, six years, chances are that it will be great for the first year to year and a half, but then it will start to become decidedly mid-range around that two-year mark but it will rapidly go downhill past the third year. A lot of course depends on exactly when you bought the parts, but let's look at an example of how future-proofing makes no real sense. If you built a new $2,000 PC around the middle of 2013, so around six years ago, chances are it would have included components like NVIDIA's $650 GTX 780, which launched in May 2013. And for the CPU, you'd likely have got the $313 i7-3770K, which headlined the unspectacular Ivory Bridge series of CPUs six years on, and I guess the i7 wouldn't be too bad actually. Certainly, had you saved money and bought an Ivy Bridge i5 instead, then you'd have been crying for much of the past two years with your four threads. However, that GTX 780 is now much slower than even a GTX 1660, which seems unbelievable, but it is nearly twice as fast at around one third of the price. But I had that performance for all those six years, you protest. And sure, you did. However, had you accepted a little less performance back then? For example, had you gone with the GTX 770 instead, which launched at $400, you would have had around 15 to 20% lower performance compared to the GTX 780 for the first three years. But then at the midway mark of your future-proofed six years, three years after buying the 780, you could have bought, say, a GTX 1070, a card which was twice as fast as the 780. Overall, you maybe paid $800 for the 770 and 1070 combined, instead of what would have been $650 for the 780. However, you'd also have got money back for the used GTX 770, so it would have cost about the same overall. 20% lower performance for the first three years of the future proofing and twice as fast for the remaining three years makes an awful lot more sense to me than buying the highest end in the hope of it being future proof for five or six years. Now sure, the 780 is an extreme example, but I believe the point stands in general. If you're building a PC for future proofing, then make that future three to four years maximum and don't fall into the trap of buying the fastest card available, thinking that it will last you five or six years. Because it won't. The eagle-eyed among you maybe noticed something odd though. The GTX 780 is today far further ahead of the GTX 770. Back when both cars launched, the 780 was only around 15-20% to faster, at least according to Anantec and Tech Power Up. Now though, in this recent Eurogamer article, the 780 is nearly 36% ahead. What's that all about? Well, the most obvious answer is simply VRAM, with 3GB on the 780 and only 2GB on the 770. 
This is one reason why it may be worth going for a higher VRAM card, future proofing of a sort. That's why I chose the 4GB R9 380 over the slew of 2GB 960s, and it's also why I brought 16GB versus 8GB VRAM to your attention in the Radeon 7 review. But what if you bought a 980 Ti for $650 back at the end of 2015, like I suggested? Well, again, it was quickly superseded by the 1070, coming in a little bit faster and quite a lot cheaper only six months later. I don't think anybody really saw that one coming, and I certainly didn't. In fact, in that build video, I said that it was unlikely Nvidia's mid-range would be much faster and cheaper for at least another year. However, if we just use the three-year midway mark again from the launch of the 980 Ti, which was middle of 2015, now it would bring us to the middle of 2018, when the 1070 was still realistically the only reasonable choice then too. Or maybe you can make a case for Vega 56 as well. It's clear though that neither of those cards give anywhere near the performance increase that we saw from the 780 to the 1070. And much of that was of course simply due to the timing. There was nothing else that was much faster at a lower price. So does that mean that my future proofing theory is short? Well, in some ways, yes, it is. And in others, perhaps not. Yes, for the simple reason that today we are living through some of the worst value in PC parts in recent history, which has the side effect of making the future proof argument work. The 980 Ti aged better than the 780 for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's got a lot more VRAM, 6GB versus 3GB of the 780, but also mainly because of the worsening value of graphics cards with each subsequent generation, and the increase in waiting time between those generations. The 1080 really should have been $400, not $600, and certainly not $700 for the Founders Edition. And had that happened, then the 980 Ti would have fallen to the same logic as the 780 did. But still, even with that, overall this 5-6 year future proofing argument that I hear sometimes, it's just pretty bad I feel, because if you stick to your 3 year upgrade plan, you can sell your old graphics card while it's still fairly relevant. We're now coming up on 3 years since Pascal launched. How much is that 1070 selling for used today? Couple of hundred bucks still? In another couple of years though, it'll be well under 100, and the longer you hold on to it, the slower it gets. And of course, now that your 6 years are done, and you're ready to build a new machine, the 1070 is worth much more than the 780. So in fact, you're pretty much guaranteed to save money by replacing your graphics card every 3 years, at a minimum. So back when I made this video, the whole future proofing argument wasn't really a great one. It simply worked out better than it should have because of Nvidia's price increases. On the CPU front, my choice here of this 12 thread $370 5820K CPU was being matched by the $250 R5-1600X. And when you consider the extra motherboard cost of the Intel platform, you're looking at half the price in reality. Again, that was just timing however. But the reality of all these choices is, some people have a lot of money and simply want the best they can get right now. That's why I called mine a smart buyer's $2,000 build. Back then you'd have seen a bunch of PC builds with a Maxwell Titan X, an i7 6700K, 32GB of DDR4, and that would have come in nearer to $3,000. And sure, it would have been the best, maybe even 5-10% to faster than my smart buy build, but it wouldn't have aged any better. The highest of the high end is still going to be squarely in the mid range, at best, three years later. So what's the point in all this? Well, as I said, I probably won't be making any build videos, but I was still intrigued enough to take a deeper look at the available parts today in order to at least figure out what I'd likely choose. And it wasn't easy. This final part of the video, I'll have a look at one or two options that I thought about but discarded for various reasons. For the entry level PC, if you recall 3 years ago, I opted for the R7 370, which with a $20 rebate was very competitively priced at $120. There are parallels to today and the RX 570, which incidentally was the replacement for the R7 370 and can now be found as low as $140, so there's not a lot of difference there. One of the major issues at this entry level though is 
the real entry-level cards, stuff like the 1050 Ti and the RX 560, they need to be way, way cheaper than what they are. Anything near $100 for the RX 560 is simply not worth paying. I wouldn't even pay $75 for that card. As far as the 1050 Ti's go though, they are a complete joke at those prices north of $150. Clearly, the 570 is the only entry-level card worth consideration today. But is it really worth buying a 3-year-old lower mid-range card today at any price? Or would you be better served on integrated graphics while waiting on Navi? This is kind of the same as that future-proofing thing, yet also different. Navi RX 360 could be around Vega 56 performance for under $200. So you might think that the pain of integrated graphics for a few months could be worth it if you're going to have years of much better performance, even with a higher price. 140 bucks for an RX 570, 200 bucks for a Vega 56. Hmm, I mean, that is a tough one, and you might just be tempted to wait it out and see just how Navi performs. Now, I just talked about integrated graphics, so clearly I'm thinking about a Ryzen APU there for the entry level. After that though, as I moved up the stack, I began to question the potential choices a lot more. It's just not simple. Whenever it looks like there's an obvious choice at a certain price point, something else gets in the way. So I decided to ask a few people on Discord for their input. For the next build up, my original choice was the i5-9400F, which seems to be faster than the Ryzen 2600X in gaming, and also competitively priced. However, it's 6 threads versus 12 threads, and 6 threads may well be the new 4 threads after our Zen 2 launches. That spawned another point of consideration over the motherboards. With AM4 being compatible with Zen 2 in some fashion, how much extra weight does that give to the Ryzen choices? Would you really want to spend nearly $300 on this CPU and motherboard? Zen 2 could be a couple of months away. 6 cores and a dead-end motherboard? I just don't know if it's worth it. So weirdly, again, it does come down to some kind of future-proofing. With CPUs though, it's much more about small differences in frame rates, especially when you're using a mid-range graphics card, as the card should be the limiter on performance. In reality, there should be hardly any difference between any of the modern i5 and r5 CPUs, or even the i7s and r7s in the majority of cases, when using a mid-range card. So if that is the case, why choose this 6 core locked Intel CPU in the first place when at best you're looking at a couple of FPS difference today and the risk of 6 threads being an actual drawback 3 years later in much the same way that quad cores are now? Is a couple of FPS today really worth what you're potentially going to lose? These are the questions I was asking myself. At first, I really liked the look of this 9400F. But on deeper analysis, I found it harder and harder to justify. Moving up the stack again, and this is where I really started to notice the major issue with PC parts today. My overclockable i7 build under $1,000 is simply not feasible today. For starters, i7s are pretty highly priced. $410 for the i7-9700K. Or you could get the previous generation 8700K for $370, but then there's a Z390 motherboards to go with it, and that's another $140 on top. Over $500 for an i7 CPU and motherboard today, but worse than that was the choice in graphics cards. Back in my 1000 build 3 years ago, I was able to squeeze in an R9390, which at the time would have been considered upper mid-range, basically on par with the GTX 970, and coming in below $300. $300 today won't even get you an RTX 2060, which is squarely in the mid-range. Realistically, you'd be looking at a 1660 Ti instead, but you can abandon any hope of getting anywhere near this same relative performance at today's prices. And if that wasn't bad enough, it just got worse. I mean, here's the thing. I'm looking at all these PC parts, trying to put together the very best builds I can, but no matter what I do, there are extreme compromises being made everywhere. Try to make a really decent upper mid-range PC today, and you'll see what I mean. In previous years, it wasn't that hard. You just stuck in an X70 class of GPU in there, like the 1070, the 970, 
or the R9 390. Do that today and you have RTX 2070, mostly coming in at over $500. What's really depressing is when you look at the alternatives though, of which on the AMD side, there are none worth mentioning. And with Nvidia, you either drop to an overpriced RTX 2060 or move up to an overpriced RTX 2080. Moving up was what I decided to do for my next Smart Buyers $2,000 build. The difference this time though is it's not actually possible to buy Smart at $2,000. Really, at $2,000, you ought to be looking at the i9-9900K, but it's 510 freaking dollars. And make no mistake about it, Intel is still selling these by the barrel load. They must be, as this CPU shortage has lasted nearly a year now and is likely to continue. But the GPU situation is even worse. Remember when buying the top TI card was a much smarter move than buying the Titan? You can thank Nvidia for taking even that option away from us. A minimum $1,200 for the 2080 Ti means you can barely even get a graphics card and top-end CPU and motherboard now for under $2,000, leaving you with no real alternative but to accept the RTX 2080 instead. A graphics card compromised by 8GB of VRAM if you want to stay below that price. Try it though. Try and build a smart buyer's PC for under $2,000 today. And you know what you'll likely end up doing? You'll end up paying over $400 for that i7 9700K, an 8-core, eight 8-thread eight CPU that is probably going to be lower than mid-range when Zen 2 launches in a couple of months' time. So you might say, well, Jim, why don't you just go with a 2700X instead? But come on, are you really going to go with a Ryzen CPU for a high-end gaming build? That right now is sadly a compromise. The 9700K and the 9900K are simply better gaming CPUs. And myself and the other guys on Discord had this discussion and we concluded that for a high-end gaming build, you are going to go with Intel one way or another and you really do have to pay for it. Zen 2 maybe change that, or it may not. And when I looked over the builds that myself and a couple of the other guys came up with, I realised that this $1,000 PC from three years ago is now basically the $2,000 PC of today. You're getting not quite the highest end CPU and an upper mid-range graphics card, and it's costing you twice what it cost three years ago. Ryzen 3000 and Navi cannot come fast enough, and I believe that even the most deranged Intel and Nvidia fanboys must secretly be hoping that both perform great, even if that was only to bring down both these companies' current pricing schemes. I'll catch you later, guys. <laughs>